An hour later, the pair finally collapsed against the sweat-soaked sheets of their bed. Julie's mind was scrambled, her body exhausted, her spirit devastated. I love you, Raymond said. You're everything. Yeah, you too, she whispered as sleep crept up on her. In other words, it was just like every Wednesday night. The next morning, Julie was distracted, her mind repeatedly circling back to the straight thought that had flicked through her head the night before. Is this really what I want? She tried to dismiss it. After all, it wasn't unusual for stray thoughts to wander through her mind when she was in bed with Raymond, her walls torn down by the inexorable force of his love and closeness. Some were the usual daily musings, like do I need to get gas or did I remember to pay the water bill? But her first couple of orgasms generally drove the ordinary thoughts from her brain. Soon, the thoughts going through her head were more the cosmic consciousness variety things like do we exist outside thought? Or is Raymond deciding what to do next, or am I telling him with my mind? Or, last night, is this really what I want? It was a big question, and she resented the way it buzzed around inside her head. Being an assistant manager in the gift shop of the Alfred E. Mitchin Museum of Modern Art wasn't exactly rocket science, and she'd often lamented that she was barely making use of her BA in art management. On this particular day, she was grateful that her job wasn't more demanding. Still, her distraction drew the attention of her co-workers, and by the time lunch came, her friend Carolyn Murray was desperate to know what was going on. Okay, spill, she said to Julie after they settled at their usual table. What are you talking about? There's something on your mind. Carolyn poked through her salad in search of a mushroom. What's going on? I have no idea what you're talking about, Julie muttered, her eyes sliding away. Come on, Julie, do you think I was born yesterday? Carolyn scoff, you've been out of it all morning. Everybody's noticed, you've been ringing up the wrong items, staring into space. Did you wonder why Darren put you on inventory? Crap. Yeah. You're not fooling anybody, Carolyn said. So, come on, honey, what is it? It's Raymond. Carolyn laughed, of course it is. What's he doing wrong? Nothing. Really? Julie sighed. She rolled her eyes. It's just... Do you ever look back and wonder if you made the right decisions? Every day, Carolyn put her hand over Julie's. You having second thoughts about marrying him, she smiled reassuringly. Honey, we all look back sometimes and wonder about what if. What if we married that hot guy we dated in college? What if we zigged when we could have zagged? Hell, that's why I'm still single. Too many options, and I couldn't settle on one of them. Never found someone who hit all the points on the checklist, my problem's a little different. Julie shrug, then again, I am thinking about the guys in college. Raymond's not as good as your college boys, Julie laughed. Oh, no, Raymond's much better than anyone I dated in college. Deader than anyone I've ever had, she shook her head. My god, those college boys were terrible. It was like I was giving them lessons, Raymond rocks my world. That sounds great, is it? The smile left Julie's face. That's the thing about having your world rocked. Do you always want it? What are you talking about? Julie glanced around the cafeteria. They'd taken a late lunch, and there was only one other person in the room, a schlubby-looking guy sitting at a one-top table, reading a book. She looked back at Carolyn. So here's the thing. Raymond is amazing. I mean, seriously, I think the man might be some kind of sexual savant. Carolyn cocked an eyebrow, still not seeing the problem. Every night I'm with Raymond, it feels like he flips my world upside down, like he turns me inside out. I fall asleep feeling completely fulfilled, still not seeing how this is a bad thing. Well, think about it. Imagine getting that every night. I'm beginning to hate you. Julie closed her eyes as she tried to find the right words. Imagine getting world-changing, mind-blowing sex one on top of another. Imagine getting one wave of pleasure after another, each one knocking you down as soon as you start to get your feet under you. Imagine sex so intense your thoughts fly apart, you forget your name, who you are. Carolyn shifted in her seat. Okay, now I know I hate you. I know, I know, it sounds great, Julie shrug, maybe too good to be true. But really think about it. Caro, think about losing track of yourself, forgetting who you are, feeling like your edges are blurring as you combine completely with someone else. I have never had that, 
It sounds amazing. It is amazing, but it's also scary. It's like I'm disappearing, dissolving, like I'm not Julie anymore. Not myself. Carolyn shook her head. Okay, let's say I get it. I don't, but let's say I do. They both chuckled. That still doesn't explain why you're thinking about your college boyfriends. Well, that's the thing. I mean, they were terrible. Julie laughed. I was lucky to get some little pleasure out of them before they rolled over and fell asleep. She froze, a crooked smile on her face. She realized what her brain had been dancing around. Sometimes, I kind of miss it. She whispered, "I don't understand you." Julie looked again at the guy across the room, thinning blonde hair, a little chubby, khaki pants, white shirt, brown cardigan. His book was Jonathan Livingston Siegel. Yeesh. It doesn't sound great, but it was enough. You know, sex with them was kind of fun and kind of hot, but not too hot, not too exciting. We'd have sex, I'd go to sleep, and the next day I'd be back to normal. Sometimes it didn't even mess up my hair. She chuckled. With Raymond, though, it says so much every time. It leaves me wrecked and wrung out. The next day, it's like he's still inside me somehow. It usually takes most of a day to find my feet. Then. Just as I'm getting it together, we tear up the bedroom again. I lose myself again, and the whole process starts over. Carolyn's eyes were wide. That sounds incredible, but that's the thing. Julie cocked her head. What if I don't want my world rocked, Caro? What if I just want those normal, easy little nights of college sex? No messy hair, no messy emotions. God, I really hate you. Carolyn tried to laugh, but it sounded hollow. But why not just tell Raymond what you want? What? Tell my husband I want boring sex. Carolyn snorted. Well, maybe not quite like that. Maybe just tell him that you feel like the wild monkey sex is getting in the way of your emotional relationship, and that you want something a little more intimate, a little more low key. You think he'd go for that? I don't know. A man going for sex? It's crazy, Julie. But it just might work. Their laughter was easier. Just tell him that you want to connect more. He'll probably be over the moon, especially when you let him know that you want to try it out immediately. Julie gave the guy across the room another look. So normal. I'll give it a shot. I still hate you. Seriously. Raymond came home to the spicy smell of chicken and wine, hot chorizo and sharp chilies. Bass chicken, the dish Julie made every time she wanted something. He smirked as he shucked off his jacket and shoes. Julie. I'm home, in the kitchen. Julie was feeling skittish, so she covered it by being almost Disney-level cheery. She prepared carefully for her conversation. After all, critiquing a man about the way he makes love was dangerous. Probably more so with a man like Raymond, who puts so much of himself of his soul into it. She wasn't sure how to proceed. She'd never really had anything to complain about before. Dinner provided cover for most of the night. And the familiar routine of compliments and conversation, of passing dishes and giving meaningful glances while sipping wine carried her through the meal. But when dinner was over, Raymond sat back, wiped his mouth, and gave Julie that smoldering look that seemed to come like second nature to him. Damn Latin lover! Even when he isn't trying, he heats up the room. Okay, what is it? He finally said, lounging back in his chair. What do you mean? Raymond snorted. Bass chicken. Flirty dress, fresh makeup. You doing your best impression of Jackie Kennedy? All the signs are there. Do I need to start inspecting the car for dents, or are you going to tell me what's on your mind? Julie gave him a sexy little pout, but when she saw that he wasn't going to give in, she let out a sigh. Well, actually, it's about our sex life. Yes, he said. Well, that is, it's so um intense. Julie looked up, caught his expression. Not that that's a bad thing," she exclaimed. "Sex with you is the best I'd ever had. The thing is, well, the intensity. Sometimes I feel like we get lost in it." Raymond's expression clouded. "So you want to stop having sex? No, no." Julie let out a light little giggle. "Absolutely not. I want to keep having sex. I love our sex." Raymond sighed. "So what do you want, Julie? I want to try it slow tonight, tender." Not our usual intense, blowing me out of the water. Sex, I want to try connecting differently. Raymond's shoulders slumped in relief. That's it, 
Jesus, you had me scare. To be honest, that sounds great, he grant. Are you down for giving it a try tonight? Really, you don't mind. I was worried, Julie. Raymond interrupted. Think about it. You're offering me sex with the woman I love, like I'm going to say no. Sex that night was everything Julie had asked for. Slow, romantic, intimate. None of the searing pillow talk that had characterized most of her relationship with Raymond, he spent his time tasting her, savoring her. When he finally began, Julie felt their connection pull at her. And as he slowly cradled her in his strong arms and staring into her soul with his deep, dark brown eyes, she felt every morsel of herself pulled into her man, drawn into the love that they shared, when they finally came for the last time simultaneously. She felt herself, once again, exploding apart. And, just as every other night, she felt herself no longer a singular being. Part of something larger, larger, but less personal. She clenched her eyes closed. It was terrible. Julie was at lunch with Carolyn again. And, again, she was poking and probing at the Ani she felt with Raymond. He couldn't go slow, no. Worse, he was perfect. He took his time. Julie chuckled humorlessly. It was agonizing, feeling him stretch me, savor me. Stop. Seriously. Carolyn leveled her eyes at her. If you finish that sentence, I don't know if we can be friends. It was perfect, Caro. There was nothing I could complain about, nothing he could have done better. And it was dot 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 different. Most nights, I end up physically wrecked. I know. I've seen that day after look on your face, Carolyn said. Lucky bitch. Last night, I was just dot 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 emotionally ruined. It was like he looked so deep inside me, like I was seeing the world through his eyes, and he was seeing it through mine. Julie scanned the room. The bland guy was at a different table. Today, he was reading Love Story Anne, wearing another cardigan. Same glasses, same thinning brown hair. She shook her head. I didn't know where Raymond stopped and I began. I feel like I'm losing track of myself. You know you're describing pretty much every romance novel I've ever read, right? I know. And the thing is, if anyone was telling me about this, I'd assume that she was the luckiest girl in the history of the world. I mean, who wouldn't want to have a man that much into her? Julie growled with frustration. Me. That's who. I mean, seriously, who complains that the sex is too good? Carolyn rolled her eyes, I'm asking myself the same question. I just feel like there's nothing of me, no I that he doesn't touch. I need sex that doesn't take me out of myself. She threw up her hands and stared at the man again. He just seemed so, normal, so bland, for God's sake, love story. Raymond's like modern art. He's a Lichtenstein or a Picasso. He's Guernica, bold, intense, consuming, she laughed. And I'm whining because I want something from the Hudson Valley School. Or, hell. Maybe a Bob Ross, something that looks good over the couch and goes well with beige. You've got a masterpiece and you want one of those canvases they sell at the starving artist shows at the airport Hilton. You're killing me, Julie, right? And it's not like I can complain about anything else, either. Raymond knowns to Jim's, buys me a new car every couple of years, pays for our house. Hell, I couldn't afford to have this job if I needed to support myself, she sighed. In every way it's possible for a man to show his love. Raymond does it. He's perfect. Carolyn rolled her eyes, you poor bitch. Whatever are you going to do? Jesus, I have no idea. It was raining when Julie got off work and her car wouldn't start. She was getting ready to call an Uber when there was a knock on her window. Looking through the water-specked glass, she saw the man from a cafeteria holding up a black umbrella. She cracked open the door dot dot. Um, yes, hi. He gave her a tentative smile. Car trouble? Yeah. Won't start. She looked him over. Rain-speckled glasses and a khaki trench coat. Don't I know you? From the cafeteria? I'm Harold. Harold Layton. He adjusted the umbrella. Gave her his hand to shake. It was clammy, but she figured that was probably the rain. At least, she hoped so. I'm an admin. In the accounting department. Julie Garcia. I'm in the gift shop. I know. I've, ow, seen you there, he blushed, so, ow, do you need any help? I was about to call an Uber, my car's over there, he said. I'd be happy to give you a ride. 
Julie had never seen him this close. Average features, average height. A little overweight, but he wore it well. Bland, like an unoffensive landscape. Perfect for hanging over the couch, sure. Ah, uh, Harold, thank you. Just give me a sec, she sent a quick text to Carolyn and grabbed her bag. Harold's Camry was parked to spaces over, and they shared his umbrella. The car told Julie a few things about Harold. He was tidy, but not obsessively so there was a little clutter in his ashtray, and his carpet could use a vacuum. Still, a few steps above what she expected from a bachelor. As for music, he seemed to have a thing for generic, relaxed, lounge and easy listening. The most challenging thing he played seemed to be Jason Mraz. They talked about the weather, the town, work. Bland conversation, but oddly comforting, it didn't require too much from her. He was also gentle and tentative when he accidentally slid his hand over hers. A moment later, she not so accidentally gave his a squeeze. So this is where you live, Harold said, as he drove up Julie's driveway. It's a nice neighborhood, she said. Bland small talk, bland and comforting. I live a few blocks over, on Crescent. We're neighbors, she said. Just about, he answered. Anyway, I'll, um, see you at work. Yeah, see you. Thanks for the ride. There was that slightly awkward moment when the ways they could say goodbye loomed like a social faux pas in the making. Then she decided to give him a handshake and he gave her a warm, dry squeeze in return. Not clammy anymore, she thought. Then she was out of the car in the house, and back in Raymond's loving arms. A week later, Harold walked across the cafeteria from his table to hers, just like in some high school movie. He offered to carpool with Julie, listing out his reasons as only an accountant co. He only lived a couple of blocks away, so it would be convenient for both of them. Plus, he noted, there was the matter of gas and parking. And, not incidentally, it would be nice to have somebody to talk to on the drive to and from work. She quickly agreed, even though his reasons weren't all that convincing. After all, gas only cost a couple of bucks a week, besides which, she often stopped by the grocery store on the way home from work, so commuting with Harold would probably be less convenient, less time-saving, and more expensive. But then there was the whole company on the drive thing. Her mind kept returning to the way his hand brushed hers. His touch didn't set off any fireworks or flames or electricity. Her eyes didn't dilate, her breath didn't quicken, her nipples stayed soft and her pussy stayed dry. But it was comforting and easy, soothing. There were no messy emotions or confusing energy. At first, Raymond was concerned about Harold then he met him. It wasn't like Harold gave Raymond much to like or dislike in truth. The guy was definitely the cornstarch in the gravy, the potatoes in the chowder. Reassured. Raymond gave his blessing and complimented Julie for finding a way to save some money and time. Riding in Harold's car before and after work, she learned about the intricacies of the accounting department at the museum and the convoluted politics of Harold's side of the neighborhood, he joes of model building and the dubious wonders of contemporary easy listening music. Most of all, she learned about Harold and most of what she learned cemented her earlier impression. To put it mildly, Harold was boring it was delightful. To boring parents who had been married for 35 years. 12 boring years at a boring public school, followed by 4 boring years at a mid-level state university, where he studied accounting, which was boring. He spent Wednesday nights playing Dungeons and Dragons, Saturdays dishing out foo at the Water Street Soup Kitchen and Sunday mornings in the First United Methodist Church. He loved The Office and could quote every episode verbatim. No surprise there, Carolyn said, when Julie reported to her, he's a total Toby. So that was Harold, 30 years old, never married, thinning hair and a little overweight, with wireframe glasses and a penchant for clothes that ran the spectrum from brown to beige. As far as Julie could tell, the most controversial thing he'd ever done was brush her hand that afternoon in his car. Over the following months, they slowly progressed from hand touching to hand holding to cheek kisses to dry kisses on the mouth. They made a point of never eating together in the staff cafeteria, but left the building once a week to grab lunch in the deli down the street. Three months after Julie's first ride in Harold's car, she went to his church and met his parents. Julie assumed that Harold had told his family and friends that she and Raymond were having problems, and that was the truth, although Raymond didn't know it yet. Julie still had world-shaking sex with her husband, 
but sometimes her mind started wandering even before it was blown. And while Raymond continued to discuss his day with her, she found herself increasingly speaking in vague generalities about her work at the museum. The first time Julie had sex with Harold, Raymond was out of town at a convention. She went to his house ostensibly to check out his collection, Pez dispensers and they ended up in his bed. It was everything she had wished for. Uninspiring, unimaginative, and decidedly by the book. Afterward, they lay side by side, both staring at the ceiling, lost in their individual worlds, it was bliss. Julie didn't check that night, but she was sure that her hair wasn't even messed up. After he got back from the conference, Raymond was bursting with excitement, full of ideas for improvement and expanding his gyms. Julie tried to pay attention, but her thoughts kept wandering to Harold. She perked up when Raymond mentioned and that he was going to another regional conference. It was only going to be for a couple of nights, he said. That time, Harold came to her house, they slept in the guest room bed both nights. Julie didn't make much of an effort to hide the growing distance in her marriage and wasn't surprised a couple of weeks later when Raymond confronted her and Harold in their deli. Watching her soon-to-be ex-husband, Julie was once again reminded of the magnificent creature she had married and from the looks of things was soon going to divorce. Raymond didn't storm, didn't rage and fury. In fact, if it weren't for the tightness of his jawline, she might not have even realized how hurt he was. He calmly approached their table, sat down, and nodded at her right hand, which was intertwined with Harold's left. How long? he asked dot dot. Julie looked down, unable to hold Raymond's eyes. Her slender hand and Harold's soft, chubby fingers laced together. Three months, she whispered, since that day he drove me home. How long have you been screwing? She flinched, about a month. That's... That's great, Raymond said. His voice was firm, almost emotionless, although Julie could hear the roughness just under the surface. And when were you going to tell me? Julie flinched, she hated this. As calm as Raymond was, she could still feel the anger and pain pouring off him. The intensity that was tucked away, just out of sight. Soon, when? When I knew for sure, she said. Harold was silent, but Julie could feel the warm, steady softness of his hand. He gave her a little squeeze. That's, that's great, Raymond repeated. Was I your plan B, or was he? Don't answer that, he said as Julie looked up at him. I don't want to know. I never meant to hurt you, Julie whispered. I'm sure that will give me a lot of comfort in the coming years. How did you find out, you? You've never been all that attentive, all that here, but over the past few months, it's been like living with a mannequin. When I came back from the conference, I was so excited. I had so many ideas for building the business, getting us to a place where we could talk seriously about starting a family dot 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 double quotes he speared her with his eyes. You didn't hear a word I was saying, I think I knew then. Why didn't you say something? There's a world of difference between thinking you know something and being ready to confront someone. I figured I'd give you a chance to prove me right or wrong, so I wired up the house. Microphones, little video cameras. So you saw us, Raymond snorted, yes and no. The cameras are motion activated. When I saw the video, I thought they were broken. You see, they kept cutting in and out. Then I realized that you were moving so slowly, they couldn't catch the movement. He chuckled, a dark laugh, damn, Jules, I'm surprised there weren't buzzards perched on the headboard. Julie blushed, Raymond, I. Don't bother, Julie, I get it. Maybe you wanted something calmer. Maybe you just wanted something that wasn't me, he sighed as he got up. And now you're going to get it. Raymond. Julie. I said don't bother, Raymond snapped. He paused for a moment, and Julie could see him taking a breath, packing away his emotions. I'll try to be fair, but if you fight me, it's all going to come out. Be smart and sign the papers when they come, he turned to Harold. As for you, you don't know how badly I want to tear you from limb to limb. Harold paled. But I'm not interested in going to jail or having to shut down my business to pay you off. Besides, scars would just make you look more interesting. It'd be crueler to leave you the way you are. He smiled a cold, empty smile that Julie had to turn away from. That said, I'd stay away from dark alleys for a while. I'm trying to be smart, but right now I just really want payback, 
Raymond filed for irreconcilable differences and offered a 50% split of all marital assets, with no alimony. He'd started his first gym before they were married, and it was covered by their prenup. Julie's lawyer advised her to fight it. She was beginning to have some concerns about whether or not she could live on her salary, so she followed his advice. Raymond withdrew the petition, then refiled, offering the same split, but citing adultery. The video ended up getting played in court. Actually, it ended up getting played three times, as the judge claimed he wasn't completely sure that anything had actually happened, given that the action on camera was almost imperceptible, and the camera kept cutting out. Finally, though, he stipulated that adultery had taken place, although the lack of vigor and engagement led him to wonder if one or both of the participants had been drugged. Julie had to testify that that was not the case, that both she and Harold had engaged in sexual activities of their own free will, and that both enjoyed the incredibly slow, unathletic pace of the sex they engaged in. By the end of her testimony, Raymond was crying although, as she stared at him, Julie realized that they were tears of laughter. It was mortifying. If there's anything more embarrassing than having your bedroom performance critiqued by a 70-year-old jouch, it's having your 53-year-old mother watch a damning video, then ask you if you need to see a therapist. I mean, after what you told me about Raymond dot dot. Well, honey, just, why? Julie felt her face flush. Mom, did he beat you? Honey, no. Mistreat you? Threaten you? No. Mom, did he ignore you? Was he more interested in the business than in you? Mom, he was the perfect husband, then why? Julie, why in God's name would you throw away a marriage to him and hit your star to Harold? I mean, it's not like he's a bad guy, it's just that dot dot. Well, there's just no there there. Julie didn't know what to say. How to explain to her mother that Raymond was just too much, and that he wanted her to be too much, too, that they were to connect it. To in love, she sigh. What can I say, mom? The heart wants what the heart wants. The heart needs to go see a psychiatrist. Or an eye doctor, Julie's mom muttered. Despite the best efforts of Julie's lawyer, Raymond's videos more or less sunk her case. Given the absence of children and the fact that she was gainfully employed, the judge stated that Julie was lucky to get an even split on marital assets. He also noted that, while there was no legal justification for him to compel her to see a psychiatrist, he strongly advised that she talk to a professional. Julie and Raymond's accounts weren't all that full, as he'd insisted on pouring profits back into the gyms and only paid himself a modest salary. Still, she netted a decent-sized check from the sale of the house and was able to pay off most of her student loans. She lived at home for a few months, then moved in with Harold. A year after her divorce, they got married in his parents' church, and a year after that, she gave birth to Harold Layton, Jr. He was followed by Karen, Julie and Rob, before Harold, Sr. decided to get a vasectomy. Julie quit her job at the museum when she got pregnant with Harold Jr., but went back part-time, after Rob started school. As before, she and Harold commuted together. And, as before. She listened to a lot of Jason Mraz and Michael Bubel. Carolyn had never stopped working at the museum, and when Julie returned, she was director of merchandising services, a position that put her a few steps up the ladder from her old friend. Still, would sometimes eat lunch together in her office or the cafeteria. Julie tried not to notice the Namatag on Caro's desk, Carolyn Garcia. After their divorce, Raymond threw himself into his business and almost as energetically into the dating scene. For about a year, it seemed like Julie could barely enter a room without hearing her ex-husband's name mentioned in hushed conversations. She didn't know if he deliberately targeted the women who worked at the museum and attended Harold's church, or if he was just screwing his way through every available woman in town. Regardless, she endured the whispers, the random women fanning their faces, the odd looks, when she entered the room or took Harold's hand, ultimately, Carolyn swooped in. Julie wondered if she had just bided her time, letting Raymond get it out of his system before locking him in. They never talked about it, but Julie remembered her friend's words. It seemed that Raymond checked all the boxes for Caro, and Julie couldn't argue that her ex-husband was, indeed, a masterpiece. Carolyn never talked about Raymond, but his success was hard to ignore especially when his face went up on a billboard that Julie passed on her daily commute. He was up to five gyms in the area, 
and was looking to expand into the next state over. And Julie would sometimes see Raymond and Carolyn in the society pages at a gallery opening or a charity auction. She even caught a glimpse of them at the museum gala. Caro, a gorgeous cobalt blue gown, and Raymond in a dashing tuxedo that had clearly been tailored for him. And when he dipped her on the dance floor and whispered in her ear, Julie felt something inside her crumble. Meanwhile, she supervised the cater waiters, checked invitations at the door, and tried hard not to feel envious. Sometimes, as she sat in Harold's car listening to easy listening covers and the softest of soft rock, Julie would think about her life with Raymond and the masterpiece she left behind. And, sometimes, as she set the dining table or put out the TV trays for her family, she would feel, well, not regret, but maybe a touch of hunger, a sense that life that she could have been more. And then she thought about her family and her life, both of which were comfortably under her control. She'd look at her husband's placid face and tell herself that she was happy with the Bob Ross she came home to every night. Most of the time, she even believed it. Subscribe to the channel if you like the video so you don't miss out on the next one. Thank you.